Hello and welcome to the Agris Church Podcast. I'm Associate Pastor Taylor DeSoto. I'm Lead Pastor Dane Johansson. Today, in this short episode, we will be discussing the Granville Sharp Rule. But first, Dane, what are you reading? Uh, we met with a OPC pastor friend of ours today. That was awesome. We had a really yeah, good time great. with him. Um, huge just, blessing. Yeah, huge blessing. Actually, um, their church blessed our church with, I think it was almost like 40. It was like 50 Trinity hymnals. It's, it's 60 now. We're just going to keep up with that. We'll keep bumping them up. Above because they'll <laughs> no, like, I mean, it was, it was a lot. It was, it was yeah. two full boxes of, yeah. of, of Trinity. Like hymnals. packed to the yeah. brim. Yeah. Um, because they're switching out for uh, a Trinity Psalter for their right. church. And so they blessed us with uh, an entire thing of it. So <clears throat> that was a huge blessing. And <clears throat> yeah, we're very excited about that. He also just also loads up with tons of like good Presbyterian literature to read yep. about the Presbyterian church. Um, also just... All sorts of awesome other documents on reform liturgy and everything right, yeah. that are going to be really helpful um, mm-hmm. for formulating our own ideas and, and helping explain those to our people and stuff. So we're really, really thankful for that. So Pastor Joel was awesome in doing that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And um, one of the things he gave us, um, I have some of the TBS Bibles, the Trinitarian Bible Society Bibles, have this in the back. Like yep. I think the Westminster Reference, you can get it with the Psalms of David and Meter in the backs so of the Scottish Psalter. Mm. And then they also just sell them individually as this little mini book. And then they have a larger version. So this is awesome. I just want to show this. I, Psalms I, and This meter. is like four bucks. Yeah. TBS sells this for like four dollars. <laughs> Don't throw it on the ground. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It sells, <clears throat> they sell this for like four bucks. And That's I think so the, the, the large print one is I think seven or something. So really? Wow. wow. So these, it doesn't have music or anything. It's just, it's yeah. just the text as they translate it to be sung um, right. in 16, I think it says in the beginning, 1650. So in 1650, they translate the Psalter again to be sung. So basically, you can just do your own tunes with it. Like any of the popular tunes can work with pretty much any of these psalms. Yeah, right. That's, so, a, that's the cool thing about psalms. You can you can take like a any Trinity hymn, they'll hymn, and yeah. sing a psalm over it. Yeah, the basically. tune to yeah, it. Just, just take just the tune out it. and... In fact, a lot of them are, are like that already. Yeah, no, and that's yeah. that's what's awesome. So I, I would recommend this. I, I was doing this for a while when I was using mm. a Trinitarian Bible Society Bible that had the Psalter in the back. Mm. I would actually sing a psalm yeah. just by myself. So yeah. just me and the Lord, and I could make a joyful noise in the Lord that he appreciated, though no wow. one else would have. Um, so I, I would sing a psalm with my daily devotions. So that's awesome. So I would recommend this if you're yeah. just kind of new or interested. And, and even, if, even if you don't use it to sing, it's a beautiful translation in and of itself. Yeah, that's great. Of the Hebrew Psalter, so... And on top of that, I've been diving into this a lot this week. It's uh, the Puritan John Preston's The Breastplate mm. of Faith and Love. And it's, uh, I think, 11 sermons on faith and eight sermons on love. And it's two volumes in one. Banner of Truth reprinted this. It's no longer in wow. print, but you can find it used. I did. And it's a, it's a facsimile edition. That's cool. So it has the elongated S's and mm. uh, interesting spelling and stuff, which a lot of people are intimidated by. But you get used to it, like, really, really quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a big deal. And it's actually pretty cool treat it that way you don't even notice after a while it's just amazing stuff right, so, yeah. so his his whole thing is just pounding home free grace and 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 god's love that's given to us in jesus christ and he's just constantly like any anytime the sinner tries to look at anything but christ yeah he, he seriously just cuts you off right there and only look at christ yeah. for your salvation whether it's future or present you have to just continue to look to christ so that's been a huge blessing reading that that's um, great. I know some people don't want to read him because he's a hypothetical universalist or whatever, but that doesn't really shine through other than the fact that he's like, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. Yeah. So that was really good. What about yourself? See, this week uh, <clears throat> I've been reading just my same reading schedule mostly. I've been getting into my Bible a lot. Whenever you get a new Bible, uh, I, I tend to go a little nuts and do like five times my reading plan. So but this TBS week, sent you the one. TBS, now. Trinitarian Bible Society, sent me a Bible for review. And I did a review on my personal YouTube page, so if you want to go and check that out, it's up. It's also on the Agris blog, and uh, it's actually an old school zipper Bible. Yeah. And uh, I was I was pretty excited when they said they were sending this to me because first of all, I haven't seen a zipper Bible in forever, and second, I, I kind of was excited to have one. And it even um, has the thumb indexes too. Yeah, it has the thumb indexes. It's just like an old school Bible, but it's in the just a nice leather, and um, it's I a calfskin I, leather. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. a calfskin leather and. Uh, I'm really stoked. It, it it just fits perfectly in the hand. It's really good. Uh, witnessing Bible, that's what I'm going to be using it for when I go out with uh, some of the guys at Agros to preach the gospel on the weekends. I'm going to be able to bring in that guy. Uh, just a really good size to carry around. And plus, it's got the zipper, so you, if you drop it or whatever, it's not going to... Damn, rain, damn, yeah, rain stuff. anything like that. So it's really stuff good. Stuff in a pocket. Yeah, pocket, a little backpack or anything like that. <clears throat> Fanny pack. Oh, man. Yeah. So, you got a fanny pack. So. I did get a fanny pack. And then uh, this week, I also got Let's Study Greek. 
Uh, it's a Greek textbook that Dane and I are going to be walking through together. I'm really excited to do that. So I'm not really sure like too much about this, but Dane's talked about it on the podcast before. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good uh, introductory grammar that takes much more of a conversational storytelling approach rather than simply grammar. Um, it explains grammar stuff a lot, but um, it, it it pairs everything with a story, and it, it's really nice that way. Yeah, that so would be great. Not, um, it's not as <coughs> dense or boring. It's a lot more fun. Yeah. <clears throat> it's been out of print for a long time, so you can't get it. You have to yeah, so it, it was printed in, like, 1957, I think, it says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a long time ago. Yeah. And then, uh, actually, the, our, our OPC friend uh, gifted me the select writings of John Knox today and uh, by Presbyterian Heritage Publications, and I'm really excited. I'm probably just going to dabble through this throughout the week. Probably not read the whole thing, but just kind of get into some of it. It's got updated typesetting and spelling and things like that, so um, that's pretty cool. So John Knox's works are pretty hard to read. Um, and they're uh, the one that Banner of Truth publishes, at least. They're yeah. kind of harder to, to get into. Because that has the old Scottish, like, dialect. Yep, the old Scottish dialect and everything. But I'm really excited to, to at least kind of dabble in that uh, this week. Other than that, I'm also reading from Adam, what is it, from Adam to Christ by uh, uh, James Renahan. Kind of put it together, Nehemiah Cox and John Owen makes a highlight in there, or a, a little appearance in there. Um, so I've been reading that uh, just because of, of apparently you're not allowed to have an opinion on covenant theology as a Baptist until you read it. So I'm reading that this week. I think it's this one right here. Yeah, it's the little red volume. And then next week we will be discussing the, uh, or probably in two weeks, we'll, we'll be discussing um, some of the distinctives of what we believe in terms of covenant theology and how that uh, stacks up against 1689 federalism. Mm-hmm. And sort of how that lines up with historic Reformed covenant theology. So that'll be really good. So, so today's episode is about the Granville Sharp Rule. So in this Agris Church pod, we're calling this an Agris Church podcast short because we're going to try to make it shorter than our usual episodes. So we're going to discuss the Granville Sharp Rule and its modern implications. The rule is said to be critical in translating passages like 2 Peter 1.1 and Titus 2.13. So... What is it? And Dane, maybe you can read the definition right there that Granville provided. Yeah, Gran- Granville himself defined <clears throat> his, uh, his rule this way. <clears throat> when the copulative ke connects two nouns of the same case, visibly nouns either substantive or, adge- or adjective or participles of personal description respecting office, dignity, affinity, or connection, and attributes, properties, or qualities, good or ill, if the article ha or any of its cases... Uh, precedes the first of the said nouns or participles and is not repeated before the second uh, noun or participle, the latter always relates to the same person that is expressed or described by the first noun or participle, i.e. it denotes a farther description of the first named person. So really, in this very, very, when it's, it's properly defined, the Granville Sharp Rule has no exceptions, but basically only two applications. Um, that can be argued, like people have tried to argue that the Granville Sharp Rule has hundreds of applications in the New Testament, but really there's only two places which we mentioned before, Second Peter 1.1 1, 1 and Titus 2.13, where this rule directly applies. Well, I think, uh, what is it, Daniel Wallace has like 25 pages on it where he gives a whole bunch of supposed right. examples of it in the New Testament, but right. they don't actually matter. Yep, so the reason why it's a super specific use case, so basically what a lot of people misunderstand the Granville Sharp Rule to mean is any time there's two nouns and and one article um, connected with K, and that's not the case at all. They they have to be personal nouns. They have to be, they can't be proper nouns. The nouns have to be the same case, and the nouns have to be singular. If these four conditions are not met, then the Granville Sharp Rule has plenty of exceptions. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of exceptions outside of this really narrow definition of the Granville Sharp Rule, and it has to be stated that this grammar rule does not apply to English. Right. The Granville Sharp construction <coughs> does not extend into English. So when, when you, when you, so when it comes to translating, for example, the Granville Sharp Rule doesn't necessarily matter. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, because that might be controversial, especially since a lot of people have staked their reputation on the fact that the Granville Sharp Rule uh, carries a ton of weight. Well, that's a usual 
thing people say yeah. when talking about KGB onlyism or mm. uh, the the KGB translation in general or some of the earlier translations in English um, that the translators of these Bibles, specifically the King James. <clears throat> did not know or understand the Granville Sharp rule, yep. obviously because Granville wasn't even born yet. Right. Um, therefore, <clears throat> they mistranslated or incorrectly, or at least not as clearly translated, uh, the two major passages, which are Second Peter one one and yep. Titus two thirteen. Right. Uh, do you want me to read? Yeah, read them. Yeah, read yeah. for us. Yeah. So First Peter, Second Peter, one um, one uh, says the Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so right there, it's uh, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's one of the ones right there that I think, uh, how does like the NKJV ESV translate it? It's um, a servant. And apostle. And apostle, yeah. It, it takes out the definite article an, which doesn't exist in Greek anyway. You, you, so mm-hmm. you can translate that as an apostle or just apostle either way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're saying because they put an uh, indefinite article there, an or a, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that confuses it and makes it sound like there's two different people. Most, uh, mostly here in Titus, Titus 2.13. This is the big one, I yeah. think, that has more implications. Right, right. These are just the main two examples mm-hmm. that people actually in translation it actually shines through right. <laughs> um titus 3 uh 2 13 says this uh looking for that blessed hope and yeah. the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ um so they're saying it should be of our great god and savior jesus yeah. christ so the yeah. fact that they put our there uh before savior jesus christ um Means that they translated it incorrectly. Right, or or, or at least not as clearly because now the deity of Christ looks like there's two different people there and and that kind of thing. So that's that's the argument anyway. Right. So so basically, there's there's two things that are that 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 go on here. You have because because apparently they didn't know about the Granville Sharp rule, which they did. You read a lot of the commentaries around that time period. They discuss the, the construction, you know, they say like, well, it's d- debated whether or not this should be translated this way or that way. Specifically Calvin. Calvin talked about it, uh, and, and specifically his commentary on this. Right. Um, which means they were aware that it could be translated both ways. Right. Which means they were aware of the Granville Sharp rule. Right. Um, so they basically say that because they, they didn't talk about it or because they translated it the way they did, that they didn't know about the Granville Sharp rule. Therefore, we know Greek better than they did. Right. Um, which is... Just, uh, just an absurd statement to make. And the second, the second, um, basically objection is is it's it's, it's apologetically meaningful mm. to to translate it in the way that Granville re- um, proposed. Mm. Uh, and and this this is a huge problem in the text discussion right now is that we can't let our apologetic feelings get in the way of how we view the text. Mm. Right? We can't say like like it it becomes untenable apologetically to hold to this view of the text. It doesn't matter how you feel about an apologetic situation. What matters is what, what did God preserve? Right. I want to know what Paul said, not, mm. not what's easier to defend. Right. Mm. We, 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 aren't, <clears throat> we aren't tasked with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the chore of proving to every single infidel that, that, that God has preserved his word. That's not mm. our job. No. Right. So, you know, if the Granville Sharp rule was so vital in defending the deity of Christ, why wasn't it mentioned at Nicaea? Right. Like, you know, you can use all the same arguments that people throw at our position at the Granville Sharp or, or the the tra- the King James translators themselves, since this right. always is talking about the King James, the King right. James translators themselves who were dealing with Sabellianism mm-hmm. and Arianism and right. uh, all these other things. Why, why didn't they why did they translate the way they did if they right. knew it was going to cause all this issue? Right. And, and so this this becomes a tactic. Right. Like this becomes a tactic where essentially people do this. They say, they say, you cannot defend your faith if you do not believe the way that I believe. Mm -hmm. Even though people for centuries have defended the faith using these readings, people have done apologetics with these readings, still do apologetics with these readings. And the problem is not the Granville Sharp rule. The problem is not the rule itself in its, when applied correctly, it's a rule. Right. No one would disagree with that. Right. I mean, we recognize that that's a that's a great it's a construction of the Greek language. <clears throat> right. Right. The problem becomes when you hold people captive to it mm-hmm. and and basically <clears throat> cut off people from their from their heritage and say, you can't respect these people as an authority because they didn't know the Granville Sharp rule, even though they actually 
did they they were very familiar with this particular construction. They just translated it the way they translated it because they understood that this rule doesn't actually carry over in, into English. Right. Um, you, because no one reads, I mean, unless you're trying to read Arianism or, or modalism or something like that into these texts, th then, then the text itself doesn't say that. Right. So really, it comes down to theological, uh, the, a theological refutation, not a textual refutation. Right. So... Well, well, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. or, or were we going to touch on it later, how in English that... Yeah, we, we're going to touch on it later. So let's let's talk a little bit about the history of Granville Sharp. Sure, sure. Um, because I think people need to know where it comes from. It's not just some, like, modern invention. Um, it comes from a paper that Granville Sharp published in 1798 called Remarks on the Uses of the Definitive Article in, <clears throat> Greek, in the Greek Text and of the New Testament, containing many new proofs of the divinity of Christ from passages which are wrongly translated in the Common English Version. So, and they don't mean the CEV <clears throat> that we know as the common English version right. was done by Episcopalians in the 60s. Right, yeah. They meant the KJV, the authorized yeah. version. So, the, the, again, Granville Sharp, for as, as much of a scholar as he was, was taking his apologetic feelings and allowing it to impact his view of, the, of translation methodology. Mm -hmm. So a handful of scholars actually took his work to task. It's not like Granville Sharp like, went uncontested for hundreds of years and were the first people saying, wait a minute. Right. Hey, let's, you know, step in here. Um, because literally they went back to classical Greek. They went to Homeric Greek. They went to, they, they, they examined the whole breadth of the language up until mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. And they, and they, they, they tested the theory up on the language. Mm. So when applied to the very specific set of conditions necessary, the rule almost always holds true, but it still doesn't hold true in every example, which means it's probably not a rule. Mm. But even then, I mean, Dane, you know this, gram grammatical rules have so many exceptions in yes. every case. Right. Which is why you can't learn a language by learning its grammar. No. The, the grammar comes with acquiring a working knowledge of the language. Right. If mm -hmm. you just learn grammar, you learn grammar. You don't learn right. the language. That, right, I mean, right. Because the language comes along first. Right. And then the grammar, that's why the, the term grammarian is almost used snarkily right, right. all the time. The people that, that study the building blocks of a language but don't actually know the language. Yep. Um, that, that's been an insult that scholar, that literally theologians have used throughout the ages. Um, but the grammarians basically explain the exceptions away um, by adding more rules or saying, oh, well, this, doesn't, this, this type of noun is acting a different way than it usually does and like, things like that. But, but uh, the point of this is that the, the authors of these texts that, that, that are using the Granville Sharp construction mm -hmm. were employing the grammatical construction, and Granville was just simply commenting on the phenomenon. Right. It's not like Granville invented a <clears throat> Greek grammar construction, like that no one knew about beforehand. And that, that like, isn't that how it's Because what about, what about all the Greeks? That's right. <laughs> Like, the, the Greeks using the Granville Sharp rule every day don't know about it? Well, they know that's just how it, the language works. They don't have a, right. a term for it or a system of way to break it down right. as Granville did. But, yeah, I mean, it's usually explained as though it's something that just just then came along, that no one had ever really understood the, the Koine Greek New Testament until Granville finally explained those passages right. for people. And the King James translators always said, like, if they would have known, they would have translated differently. And they would have hopped around board and high five Granville Sharp. It's, Thank right. you so much. Now we well, know. We understand our language now. Right. And, and it's crazy because even then, the Granville Sharp rule is, is really only applicable to New Testament scholarship. <clears throat> right. Like, you, like, it doesn't really travel outside yeah, of New you, Testament You don't see scholarship. it being talked about outside of... Right, exactly. And, like, name a, a, a grammar rule that's, like, that does that in any other work. Like, do people set up grammar rules specifically for, like, R.L. Stein? No. <laughs> for Shakespeare, even? No. No. There's, there's not, like, specific grammar rules for specific authors, typically, that I'm aware of. Right. So it, it's very strange that, that you'd say, like, well, this rule only applies to New Testament Greek. And, a, and actually only two places in the New Testament. Right. Even though a case can be made for more, but really the only places that, that most people would agree are the, the two important ones are the ones we've talked about already. Right. So you usually define grammar rules across a whole language, not just across a handful of books. Right. right. Some small corpus of, people forget the New Testament uh, is, is written in Kini Greek, and it's a very small sample mm. of Kini Greek. Kini Greek isn't just the New Testament. New, Tes New Testament Greek or Kini Greek or Hellenistic Greek it, it encompasses everything from the Septuagint, the, the early church fathers, all the secular people like Lucian and everybody that were writing at that time. Yep. It, it's not just the 
Greek New Testament. And so when we yep. take a telescope, like an actual telescope, and look at the, the, the individual words in this small corpus of writing while continuing to push aside and, and neglect the rest of the writing in that dialect of yep. that language, you miss the point completely. Yep. That, that no one ever thought of it when they read this. I'm like, oh, this is a very specific kind of wording, and I have to make sure right. I understand it this way. It, it was just a language that was being spoken and written, and people understood it perfectly fine. Right, exactly. So from like a, an actual language perspective, people knew how the grammar worked. Right. Because they were using it. They were writing it. They were applying it. But it, it wasn't some mystical property that... You know, their their pen starts glowing when they start to pen the papers. Oh, <laughs> you know, this is a special meaning. You know, it just so. So why are we saying that? This, like, why do why do why do people continue to propagate the myth that this was just some like robust discovery in the 18th century? I mean, I think it, it has theological implications. The reason why they're doing it. Right. That, yeah. I think it comes down to they. It, it proves that we know better. It proves <laughs> that we have some. Yeah. higher learning and, and finally understand uh, the, the Greek New Testament whereas all these poor guys right. though they tried they just had what they had and they really worked hard to understand it but, right. but now thankfully with the tools that they came up with and the right. new discoveries they made now we understand and it's like right. do you understand Keeney Greek had been like the New Testament corpus itself right. had existed for 1800 years 1700 years at that point right? because that's when Granville came around 1700 so it had already been around for at least 1600 years mm -hmm. In 1,600 years, no one figured it out until right. Granville. Like, right. That's called what C.S. Lewis would call chronological snobbery. And it's, and exactly. it's, the, it's the best term for this kind of and, thing. And we, we use it all the time because it's so true. It's, it's, uh, and I think it's honestly the, the product of people being grammarians and not knowing the language. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you think that you've discovered something new about a really old language, I'm sorry, but you're probably wrong. Right. You know, if there's anything I've learned about being ostensibly reformed and being really, you know, way too young to have an opinion, it's it's that look to the old paths, look right. back to the men that you should look to. And like Calvin didn't have any problem exegeting these texts no, at all. And he even mentions the whole topic at hand. Right. He didn't say Granville because he was 200 years before Granville. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he certainly could, understood the grammar there. If Calvin didn't feel it necessary to name the, gram the grammatical construction... He, he clearly didn't view it as, as a big of a deal as Granville did. Well, and I think it's important. It goes back to what you said in the beginning, that yeah. it was his, his apologetic mm -hmm. uh, feelings, is the way right. you termed it as brilliant, uh, his apologetic feelings to... Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to make sure he was defending the deity of Christ, which is admirable. Right, that, right. That's like, great. praise God. Course, and, yeah, and, I, and even, like, I think the Granville Sharp rule can demonstrate that apologetically, but it has nothing to do with your translation methodology. Right, yeah, and, and he connected, because at the time, the, the Arians that he was dealing with were mm. pointing to the King James and just misreading the English that's plainly in front of them, right. uh, and saying, we'll see that it refers to two different people, our great God right. and our Savior. There's two people there. Um, he then, I'll go back to the Greek, look at it, figure it out, and, oh, I found a rule, um, and, and tried to say, well, see, this is how Greek works, therefore, the translation is irrelevant because it, we're looking at the Greek, not the English, the Greek says this, blah, blah, the English is actually, he went so far as, like, the English is actually translated wrong, right. and this is how it should be translated, this is what it actually means, and therefore, right. it can't be two different people, so his theological uh, presuppositions, his theological mm. program uh, yeah. led him to uh, dismantle the text that was in front of him in English and cast yeah. doubt upon it. It right. obviously wasn't what he was trying to do, but, oh, yeah, yeah, but not, he, yeah, he had yeah. one goal in mind, which was to defend the deity of Christ. Right. And he was willing to do what he had to do to do it, but instead right. of just dealing with the text in front of him, he tried to use this rule. Because if, if he could prove that the rule exists, mm -hmm. then they couldn't argue with the rule. Um, right. Whereas he should have just been arguing theologically. You don't have to go back to the Greek. Um, if right. all you have is this King James Bible in front of you, whether you use King James Bible or not, um, if all you have is this in front of you, you right. can defend the deity of Christ just fine. Even if they want to go, oh, well, that's two different people clearly. And you can go, well, right. no, it's not. But let me take you to the rest of the scriptures where the deity of Christ is talked about. We, sh we don't have to be going back to Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and all these different things to constantly be defending things. When, especially when it's a theological issue. Right. If we're talking about 
manuscript evidence, we're talking about translation methodology, all that kind of stuff, yes. But if you're talking about defining the deity of Christ, deity of Christ, it shouldn't even be about translation or anything anyway. Right, like, like <clears throat> there, there's like a couple things that, that I want to talk about what you just said. Uh, if the, the part of the problem with this whole going back to the Greek thing is, is that it make, people that do apologetics for a living make people feel... That, that just have English, that just have English or Spanish or German or whatever it is, feel like they can't do apologetics. Right. And so what they'll do is they'll memorize the, the particular scholar that they like's argument, mm -hmm. and the second that they get out of their depth, they will fall apart and will not be able to defend it because they're relying upon some mystical meaning pulled out of the Greek. Right. Some, so some if, grammatical rule. Right, perfect. And that, that's, yeah. that's perfect statement, way to put it, because mm -hmm. if, say, and I've done this, I've been in this situation mm -hmm. before I knew... Uh, Greek as as well as I do now, which isn't mm. the best, you know. But I mean, I, I've I've learned a lot more since this point. But there was times I would memorize, um, just like you said, I would listen to a, a favorite apologist of mine or or a, a favorite you know theological lecture, mm. whatever. And I knew the arguments in there, and they were often often using the Greek or whatever. So mm. then when I was using the Greek in my yeah. discussions with people, and they knew more Greek than I did, yeah. then they'd be like, oh well, actually it doesn't do that. Uh, mm. Blah blah. When they start arguing using. Greek, Greek, because I was arguing using Greek yep. or Hebrew, I s very soon was out of my depth, and yep. now my argument made no sense and fell apart, and I just felt stupid, yep. because I need to, I should have just pointed them to the person in the first place, or just use the argument on my depth, not yep. on somebody else's depth. Well, then it's, and, it's, and that leads into the second point, is that if you've ever <laughs> talked to an anti-Trinitarian, or a Unitarian, or a Sabalian, or you know wh whatever it might be, um, they, they are trying to attack the divinity of Christ. They're trying to attack uh, the unity of God um, in saying that the Trinity is not a thing. Um, and they will find any way to do it. They'll, they'll, they'll go as far as to say, my, my interpretation of the Greek is correct no matter what. When it comes to debating debating a Trinitarian, it, it's, it's fruitless. Right. Um, Non-Trinitarian? Yeah, sorry. Non, yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. Non-Trinitarian, it's, it's fruitless because... Uh, I, I think that people that are anti-Trinitarian uh, do have, a, have a, indeed a deception. Right, right. And, and it, it is a spiritual thing, not an, intell an, an intellect thing. Right. You know, so you can, you can sit here and debate and debate and debate with an with a anti-Trinitarian. Um, I'm telling you, unless that the Holy Spirit works in them, um, they are not going to see what you're seeing, no matter mm -hmm. how sophisticated your argumentation is. Right. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the, the, the Holy Spirit's going to have to work in them to, for them to even understand what you're saying. And, and so really what you need to be doing is preaching the gospel to these people and, and, and letting the gospel I, either save them or judge them. Right. Um, but, but the point of that being is that no grammatical structure is going to, you know, be your like escape lever from the anti-trinitarian right right they're going to do what they're going to do and like i said if you've ever talked to one they they, they don't yield no they don't they're some of the hardest people to talk to honestly because they're great proof texters they can constantly they can pull up a bunch of verses they're really good proof texters. And, and no matter how much greek you go back to or anything else then yeah. it doesn't matter it's a, it's yeah. a spiritual warfare just like you said and so granville sharp i think that's the error mm. that's probably the critique we're making against him one of the one mm. of the critiques is that um, he was dealing with the Socinians at the time and, and, and was trying to defend the deity of Christ. That's great. I mean, right, yeah. and, 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 you know, praise God that he was doing that. Um, hmm. but he went the wrong direction in my opinion. Hmm. Um, he, he went the direction of, okay, let me go to the Greek when he should have been dealing with theology. Right. He's dealing with intricacies of language and translation. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so now, <clears throat> cause, cause at the end of the day, okay, if Granville Sharp's rule was correct, Basically, he said the common English version, which he meant was the authorized version that everyone in England at the time was using. Right. Um, uh, now that's incorrect. I, I'm showing this is incorrect yep. because I know Greek and I'm using it to defend the deity of Christ. So now everyone in the pew who doesn't know Greek mm -hmm. uh, has a Bible that they cannot, from that verse, defend the deity of Christ with. Is essentially right. what you're coming down to. Right. And, and that's yeah. what's still claimed today. And, and that pattern continues on and has been <clears> a strategy <throat> of people that want to... Uh, basically reject the KJV, which is, you know, I guess you, you, that's your prerogative. Right. Um, but you want to go into translation methodology. You want to go into the scholarship that was applied, the, the level of knowledge of Greek language. There, there is nobody alive that can do what they did. Mm -hmm. And so it, your problem could be with the, with the outdatedness of the language, but your problem should never be with the actual work done. 
Right. You know, and, um, you know, there's obviously places where people debate and go back and forth in terms of, you know, could a different word be used here? Sure. But but overall, you you compare the KJV to modern versions, the level of trans, the kind of translation work that was that is being done today is 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 silly. Yeah. It, it, it's not even close. Right. You know, so at the end of the day, you have, you have to you come down to this place where 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 you've allowed your apologetic feelings to get in the way of your theology. Mm. And you, you, you arrive at this thesis, which basically says that the Granville Sharp rule should de- determine or first of all, declares that our authorized version is no longer adequate. Mm. And then you have this idea that's now propagated that they didn't even know Greek. So, so not only are you saying that the, that the KJV or the authorized version is, is inadequate, you're saying that the scholars that produced it and the scholars leading up to Granville Sharp just didn't know Greek. They're ignorant. It's like you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater there. Right. Even though they did know about the construction, they just didn't view it as important. Right. Um, so, so the question we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day is this. Is the thesis correct? Mm-hmm. Do modern Greek enthusiasts know Greek better than the greats that we are standing on the shoulders of? Right. And the question that we have to answer is not whether or not the Granville Sharp rule describes what is happening in Greek. It indeed is describing a Greek grammar phenomenon, something that's going on in the Greek in a very limited range of, of applications. So oftentimes it is misused. Right. But the, the proper question is this. Does translating it the way that the KJV does change the meaning or demonstrate that they did not know Greek? What would you say, Dane? I would say absolutely 100% no, it doesn't demonstrate that at all. I think Granville Sharp completely missed the point and was actually wrong, like dead wrong, Hmm. when he said that it's mistranslated in the common English version Hmm. or the authorized version or the King James Bible. So when we look at the authorized version in front of us, uh, Titus 2.13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Jesus Christ, that that is not translated incorrectly. It's translated correctly. Mm. Um, and that it, it works just fine and, and defending the deed of Christ that, that mm. he didn't have to attack, uh, and cast doubt upon the translation itself to prove his point. He should have gone to theology. So no, I would, I would right. say no, that doesn't prove either of those points that the KJV is translating correctly or that it's translators did not know Greek as well as Granville. Yeah, I, I would 100% completely agree because we have to remember at the end of the day, the Granville Sharp rule is not in English. Right. It, it doesn't carry over into English. So when we're talking about translating Greek into English, the context of the words that we use in English heavily determine the meaning of the words that we're using. Um, our, our, our language is actually kind of vague, honestly, yeah. in comparison to some of the more precise languages like Greek. Yep. So this is obvious if you apply the Granville Sharp rule to English. Right. Where basically the number of exceptions are so abundant, they can't be counted. Like we, we've used this one a bunch. Um, I know you have a couple written down too, but I think yep. this one's really good mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, um, I, I'm, I have the blessed privilege of being uh, Taylor's uh, daughter's godfather. Meaning, you know, he's giving me that honor. Mm. It's not that's not like the Catholic version of that. It's just like right, I, yeah. I have the honor of being uh, in her life that I've committed to to helping see her through to uh, right. maturity and, mm. and making sure to keep him and, and Laura on track that they're raising him her up in the Lord and all that kind yep, of stuff. Doing and family just worship. Her. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So anyway, um, I'm I'm the lead pastor at a church that he co pastors mm. and I am his uh, daughter's godfather. So Taylor could look at me and say, or be talking about me and say, Dane, my co-pastor and the godfather of my daughter. Right. Are those two different people? Obviously, context tells us that's not two different people at all. Right. No one would hear that and be like, oh, when's the godfather showing up? Like, yeah, like I wouldn't say like, I'm waiting for, for the pastor and, God, and um, the pastor and godfather of my daughter to show up. Right. Is that two different people? It could be, but context determines. It depends in in, in the English language, completely determined ter- determined by context. Right. So, like, right, like in, in English, we don't have the Granville Sharp rule because right. it's just very interesting. So, like, we are waiting for the teach for his teacher and uncle. <laughs> Is that two different people? Is it two different people? Could be. It could be. It could not be. Right. Um, they are talking to the man and their dad. Two people? Who knows? You could use a million examples of like, of things like that, where the, where the Granville Sharp rule could, you know, and, and the funniest thing, you know, if, if a thousand years from now, when English has devolved into just some really weird blob of a language, 
And people go and look back to a time where our language was actually composed and had some sort of composition to it and try to apply these silly grammar rules to us, they'd probably get our language all wrong. Right. Especially if they were foreign language speakers. Especially if they're foreign language speakers. So the Granville Sharp Rule is a great example of how easy it is to describe a language without actually knowing it. Right. Like, you're, 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 you know, you, uh, what was the example that I think it might have been our friend that, that, that told us this one. Basically, this guy had um, a Bible and he was in prison. They, they gave him a Bible and said, here, this is the only thing you can read. Mm. And he, sp- he had 10 years in prison and he spent that whole 10 years counting the different kinds of parts of speech. And the, and the number of verses, the number the of chapters. verses, the chapters, the, the types of words, the number of occurrences each word that happened. But this massive magnum opus of a work they'd spent 60 years in prison doing. And after he dies, they come in and see his notebook. And, oh, my gosh, what is this man sat there just reading the Bible all day? And all he did was count things. Yeah. <laughs> Missed the point. And, and the, I mean, the textbook going gr- deeper in the Greek or do, going deeper in the Greek is a great example of this. Oh, the one by Kostenberger yeah. and uh, Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is. They'll talk about, you know, they go on and on about the instrumental instrumental dative, and it's a dative of means, and then it's a dative. It's the instrument by which uh, the, the, the cup is on the table and the hand is used to pick up the cup so that if the hand's in the dative case, it's, it's a dative of instrument. It's an instrumental dative, and it just it gets ridiculous where it's, uh, sh- should I really be having this in my brain when I'm reading Greek? Uh, I hope not. I want to be reading the Greek and, and enjoying the Greek and, and fellowshipping with the Lord over the Greek and, and reading it as a real language. Right. Not thinking of it, not not parsing it into, not even English, but parsing it into grammatical constructions. Right. You're like, you're you're like parsing grammar. it into like a meta language. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's almost like a, it's like a code language. Yeah. <laughs> so to kind of, to kind of finish up this short podcast, the Granville Sharp Rule can be great for defending the divinity of Christ. We're, mm. we're not saying that it's not, we're not saying that the Granville Sharp Rule doesn't exist. Um, we're, we're basically just saying that you have to remember that languages aren't built and then used mm. languages are used. And then grammarians come along and analyze them and try to understand the language. But if, if, if you try to treat that backwards and say like, okay, we have to look at this language like Lego blocks then you're, you're going to get something really, really funky out of your studies. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I think has happened here. Nobody in the Greek-speaking world crafted the Granville Sharp Rule. No, no one in the English-speaking rule, or world crafted the Granville Sharp Rule. It was just a part of the Greek language. It right. already existed as a part of it. So if you know the language, you will know how the Granville Sharp Rule works. And therefore, if you know the language, both English and Greek, you would know how to translate that properly into English. Mm-hmm. And, and I would... I mean, we've gone on record and said this a million times. There is nobody alive that knew both languages, like the like the men that translated the KJV. I'm sorry, no. they, they just don't exist. No. And at the time of the Reformation, the modern Greek was essentially Koine Greek still. Yeah, it was essentially the same language, even closer than it is now to modern, mm-hmm. which they're still pretty dang close. Yeah, but at that point in time, modern Greek was essentially Koine Greek. Yeah, it's, it's very very close. You can actually look at the modern Greek translation they did in the 1500s um, or 1600s, sorry, uh, that was printed in Geneva uh, that, that was, you know, the, the Reformation era mm. modern translation for Greeks. And you put it up next to your, to your Greek New Testament and it's really, really similar to the point of it's like, well, it's kind of weird that he even went. Yeah, this. It, it, yeah. It's, a, it's the same kind of thing with the KJV, I think, where they were like, yeah. we need a new one. I can't, this cannot be understood. Right. So at the end of the day, hopefully if you're listening to this and maybe you're a little upset, you're like, I, the Granville Sharp rule is really important to me. <laughs> um, it, you know, but there's a lot of people that I've talked to about this, that, that really do feel passionately about Granville Sharp. But, but I want to, I want to challenge you because the only reason I think you probably feel that way is because you had a trusted scholar, a trusted professor at seminary, trusted, you know, whatever person you're pastor, watching, friend, pastor, yeah. friend, um, anything like that, who has, who has convinced you that the Granville Sharp rule is sort of the, the turning point of the Greek language where we, we, we've now been enlightened on this language. We now understand this language so much more than they did. And that's why you have to chuck your KJV, yeah. get a modern translation, yeah. so that way you can actually have a meaningful, uh, consistent apologetic uh, d- a defense to be able to give to people. And, and without that, ostensibly mm-hmm. you can't even... Right defend the faith and right. it's like wow right so and and, and the 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 a lot of people including myself i've bought into this a, a lot in yep. my life 
where someone that I trust will say something and it will profoundly affect me. Right. And when I, when I learned that they, you know, they maybe had it wrong or they're intentionally getting it wrong, um, to propagate some narrative, uh, then, then, then I get really disappointed. I'm really bummed and I'm really shaken up, honestly. But, but at the end of the day, when you're confronted with facts, when you're confronted with the information, you have to be willing to change your mind. You have to be willing to at least look into it more, Mm -hmm. um, and understand it more. And I would say what that looks like is not going to a grammar, but learning the language, yeah, learning the language. We can't, we cannot be, be guilty of chronological snobbery like we accuse other people of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so if, if, if Granville Sharp truly knew Greek better than everybody else, um, his, his work didn't really demonstrate it, especially Mm -hmm. you look at all the critics that come after him Yeah, that, that thoroughly disproved what he was saying. Right. You know, the problem is not with our understanding of Greek. It's actually our, our understanding of the English language. Yes. And at the end of the day, that's the biggest tragedy is that we, we, we actually don't even know our own language really well. Yeah. And, and our own ability to understand theology and articulate it to defend. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, that's dead on. Right. It's accurate. Yeah. I mean, I would add one thing too is, yep. is, you know, just piggybacking off what you said. Um, you know, we, we used, we, we didn't hold to a TR position yep. for most of our time being Christian, right. for most of our time being reformed or ostensibly right. reformed or whatever it was. Um, you know, we, we didn't hold to a TR position. We didn't under, we, we would have cast, you know, kind of like a sneer eye, you know, snide eye at the KJV and been like, yeah, right. I didn't know. I mean, it's a, it was good for that time, but you know, it's so it's a, it's a beautiful translation. Yeah. The, the standard, you know, it's beautiful. I, I've memorized verses from it. I, mm. I grew up on it or whatever yeah. people say. And right. then, but then say, but it's garbage here, 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 and here. In fact, it's mistranslated all over the place and it's, right. it, you can't use it anymore. And it's right. a foreign language and all this kind of stuff. But um, just on a comment that Taylor had just said, you know, we, we looked into the evidence. We, we looked into these things. And and if you're somebody who's either on the fence or, or has recently joined uh, a confessional view of the text, or you are a Mm -hmm. TR advocate, um, keep going. Um, There's, there's always answers for things. And oftentimes it's just that our minds are, are uh, trained to think that we know better because we live in a post enlightenment age. Yeah. And so when scholars engage in argumentation that, that lines up with what we've been trained to think in our day and age, which mm. is that we know better, we know more now we, right. we have better understandings of things. We have better tools, better resources, better manuscripts, better grammars, right. better study aids, whatever. Right. Then that's when we, uh, will, will engage in that same kind of, uh, blocking out our minds and this is the way it has to be and it's this yeah. way or the highway um yeah. kind of thing and just just keep your mind open and, and look into the evidence i mean that's where that's how we right, got yeah. where we were we listened to dr riddle we we looked at what he was actually saying and been like i don't know about that and looked into it and been like okay yeah that actually holds up um looking at the the, the great men of the past that were surrounded by sitting here that right. disagreed um with, and that that, with, that defended <clears throat> what we're defending now right in the same way that we're defending now Right. Yeah. They, they took theological uh, presuppositions seriously and yeah. defended the text based on that. Yeah. So, and, and something, the last note that I'll add to that is it's very hard to disagree with a favorite authority. Yes. Uh, and it used to be that if you said all the, the doctors of the faith agree in this area, that would have been like, oh, I'm not even, I'm going to turn my brain off. Yeah. I'm just going to turn my brain off because they're right. Right. Unfortunately, right now, in this, the, the, the doctors are wildly divided in the church uh, in terms of the teaching office, the teaching desk um, in the seminaries. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying that teach, that's an official office of the church, but just you know, using jargon. Um, the, 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 the seminary professors are wildly divided right now. You know, it, it, are you allowed to take a, six, you know, a, a, a figurative creation account? Um, I mean, I guess. If that's are you do. are you allowed to say that Hammurabi or that Moses plagiarized Hammurabi? That's big in the seminaries right now. You know, th- there's there's a lot of views in the seminaries that are just kind of blindly taken, that that don't align with with historical reformed orthodoxy, mm. but they're just being eaten up because of this argument, this appeal to authority, right. where people are just saying, yeah, th- th- we can trust these guys, and not to say they're bad guys, but mm. but a lot of these. Seminaries have bought into the critical school and they've they bought into German thinking. Yeah. I, I was once told, don't you think we'd recognize if Schleiermacher was, uh, the ghost of Schleiermacher was roaming the halls? No, I don't. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't at all because 
that same argumentation about Hammurabi's code and, and Moses plagiarizing Hammurabi, which is just like humorous, yeah. is, uh, is, is that comes directly from Gerhardus von Rad and uh, all these other German Old Testament biblical theologians right. and things like that who saw it as a development from polytheism to monotheism and yeah. uh, it's out there. all these other things. Uh, that, that's that same kind of evolutionist uh, evolutionary mm-hmm. um, look at the Bible just like you would at the human uh, phylum <laughs> the human yep. the human and race what happened and, at Princeton right it's the exact same thing what happened at Princeton so so that's we all have Warfield became an evolutionist yep. and then he took an evolutionist view of the text and yep. yeah, so so it, it shouldn't surprise you <laughs> when when your favorite authority lets you down uh, I think I think the only solution and we'll end here is that you have to go back to the old paths. Yep. Don't just take what we're saying for face value. Go back to the to the old commentators, the ones pre-enlightenment, and see what they had to say about things, and you'd be surprised at how well-informed they actually were. Yeah, amen. All right, that's been it for the short Agros podcast. May the Lord bless you and keep you. I'm Associate Pastor Taylor DeSoto. Lead Pastor Dane Johansson. See you guys next time. Thank you.